Shall we begin? All right, good afternoon and welcome to the Public Safety and Government Operations Committee meeting. Uh, in attendance today, we have myself, Chair of the Committee, representing the 4th District, uh, Councilman Burnett, representing the 8th District, Councilman Cohen, representing the 1st District, uh, Councilwoman Porter, representing the 10th District, and Councilwoman Ramos, representing the 14th District. Um, representing the mayor's office, uh, we've got Sophia G, uh, and representing the office of the president, we've got President Lewis. Um, so this afternoon, the committee will be having a hearing on council resolution uh, 22-0130R, informational hearing, routine maintenance of city-owned lots and buildings for the purpose of inviting representatives of the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Department of Planning, the Department of Transportation, the Office of the Comptroller, the Department of Real Estate, the Department of Recreation and Parks, the Department of Public Works, the Department of General Services, and other interested parties to discuss current condition, excuse me, to discuss the current condition of city-owned lots and buildings, how maintenance of such properties can be improved, and the impact poorly maintained city-owned lots and buildings have on Baltimore City as a whole. Uh, this bill, this bill was, count, uh, was sponsored by Council Member uh, Burnett, uh, and I'll open up the floor to the sponsor. First test run here. Um, okay, it's pretty fancy. Uh, and, uh, before you begin, I'll just note, um, folks, you don't need to touch the microphones. Um, it'll capture you even if you're sitting back a little bit. Uh, we had a little bit of an upgrade. so. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, so the purpose of the hearing I, I, was to have a conversation about um, building conditions of city-owned properties. Um, we've had uh, the lots alone, you know, we get an, an inordinate amount of calls every year. Um, I, I promise in the budget this, well, I don't know, I may or may not continue to try and push for a single contract for that, uh, but often it's a sort of a piecemeal approach to who's responsible for what. Some are comptroller lots, some are rec and parks lots, some are housing, uh, but either way, there's some issues with maintenance um, of those spaces, whether it's illegal dumping or, or consistently keeping high grass and weeds cut. Um, but we've also gotten um, feedback from both constituents uh, and uh, staff anonymously about uh, conditions of uh, buildings like community action centers and uh, community action partnership centers and other agency buildings that I know are incredibly old, like just like this one, um, and but just some some conditions that um, have made folks who are dealing with you know if you're in an action center you're probably looking for some sort of assistance um, one way or the other and to come into that space and it's. Um, you know, not up to par or, or literally unsafe in some instances. Um, it, it's not a good look for the city. Also not a good look for the employees uh, who work in those conditions every day. Um, and similarly, we've had conversations at length about things like DPWs, um, in, uh, where folks are working out of, um, you know, showers and the locker rooms and restrooms and stuff like that, uh, that are also just not always up to par. Uh, and so wanted to have a conversation about um, the sort, sort of the larger picture around capital funding and how we're using it effectively to, to maintain these spaces and, and uh, improve work conditions, uh, particularly because folks are coming back to work now at, at, at a larger rate. And so how, how can we really get ahead of it? And so that was the gist of why I wanted to convene this meeting and hopefully we'll have a, a pretty good discussion and a path forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Um, we will now turn over to uh, agency reports, and we'll start off with the solicitor's office. Good afternoon. Michelle Bill on behalf of the city's solicitor's office. We stand by our um, If you could uh, press the right button, and a light will come on, and then we'll be able to hear you. There we go. Michelle Toth on behalf of the city solicitor's office, and um, we stand by our bill report approving for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got the Department of Planning. Uh, Kim Knox, Department of Planning. Um, we uh, take no position in the study real resolution since we don't deal specifically with maintenance of lots and buildings. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got the Department of Housing and Community Development. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Stephanie Murdoch, Director of Legislative Services for DHCD. I also wanted to acknowledge Anika Middleton, our Development Assets Manager, sitting behind me that has joined us here today. Um, we're pleased to participate in this hearing while we do not directly provide maintenance, um, such as boarding, cleaning, and, and mowing services. We do work very closely with the DPW to ensure the upkeep and maintenance of city-owned lots and buildings. Um, for the purpose of this hearing, uh, uh, we as an agency generally focus on vacant properties, vacant lots, and vacant buildings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just wanted to kind of touch on a few highlights of some of the things that we do there. Um, we have a Buy Into Baltimore program where we uh, encourage individuals to purchase properties in the city of Baltimore, and we have an interactive website that people can visit if they have an interest in a building or a lot. And we also have an Adopt-A-Lot program where we partner with uh, community organizations, entities, uh, to partner on the adoption of some of these lots, and which also helps with the maintenance of these lots in communities, so it's a, a great partnership. We also are very active in public engagement around vacant buildings in particular. Uh, we have a, um, we certainly encourage everyone to call 311 when they witness issues occurring in their community. We've actually done a um, short video that can be shared around about the hazards of vacant properties and how they can be reported and a, a one pager that I plan on sharing with committee members um, at the end of the hearing. Um, <clears throat> In general, uh, I think we'll hear a lot from DGS today about, about the maintenance of city-owned buildings, but we do stand by our bill report in support of this resolution, and both myself and Anika are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to the Department of Real Estate. The Yes. Very nice. Casey Kelleher for the Department of Real Estate and the Office of the Comptroller. We stand by our bill report um, and are here to answer any questions. Um, similar to DHCD, we share a lot of the same programs um, around encouraging people to buy our 1,300 properties, um, including anyone here today. Please buy them. Um, otherwise, we um, work with our partners in DPW and DOT to um, maintain um, and support constituent requests around them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the Department of Transportation. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Liam Davis, uh, representing Baltimore City DOT. Um, as the lead municipal agency responsible for maintaining uh, thousands of miles of public right-of-way, um, BCDOT welcomes being able to part participate in today's conversation. Beyond the maintenance of street pavement, footways, alleys, lane marking, traffic signals, and traffic lights, BCDOT's uh, oversees the management, uh, oversees significant vegetation management and mowing responsibilities. Um, a lot of times these can be seen as lots, but technically it's public right of way. Um, vegetation management within BC DOT is operates operates out of the agency's maintenance division, and DOT's landscape section has a mowing season that officially extends from April 15th through October 15th varying on weather conditions, mowing on a two-week schedule. Uh, mowing and vegetation management duties are conducted, uh, a, a blend of in-house resources within our landscape section as well as private contractors managed by that section. Uh, and then, as I said, both operating on a two-week rotation. Um, vegetation management and mowing duties include general maintenance of right-of-way, medians, soft shoulders, and out of warranty capital projects containing tree pits and specialty plantings. In total, BCDOT oversees the mowing and maintenance of precisely 437 green spaces across Baltimore City, totaling just over 410 acres. Um, we stand by our bill report, which is no objection, and we welcome uh, today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got the Department of General Services. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Annie Fullis. I am the Executive Administrative Manager and Legislative Liaison uh, for DGS. 
Um, I am joined here today by several DGS staff members. Um, in attendance to my right, we have Facilities Chief Mohammed Abdulatif. Um, and then behind us, we have Deputy Chief of Facilities King Bennett, uh, Real Estate Agent Hillary Chester, Deputy Chief of Capital Projects Chris Hepler, um, and then also listening in, we have Engineer Supervisor uh, Hernan Guadalupe and Leslie Carter, uh, Special Projects Coordinator. Um, so we have quite the crew here today. Um, we stand by our submitted report and remain supportive of the resolution. Um, and just to provide a little bit of background, um, our Facilities Maintenance Division is responsible for uh, maintaining over 6 million square feet of city-owned property. So about a third of that is made up of surplus schools. Um, another third is made up of our own buildings that fleet and facilities employees work out of. Um, also included in that bucket are um, community action centers and, and several outlier buildings. And then lastly, the other third is made up of what we call our downtown <coughs> campus. Um, so these include the buildings that house much of the city's traditional office space. Uh, so to name just a few, we of course have you know, City Hall, Abel Woman next door, uh, Cummings, Benton, 70s Redwood, um, again, just naming a few. Um, and so in total, our uh, downtown campus has roughly 3,800 city employees uh, assigned across seven buildings. Um, and so these, these facilities really, you know, they vary in age, they vary in construction type. Um, many are also deemed historic in nature and so, you know, therefore require additional ongoing care and maintenance. Um, and so our facilities team approaches maintenance in a few different ways. Uh, first, we conduct regular inspections, which is where uh, certain equipment is required by law to be inspected annually, such as boilers, elevators, fire systems, uh, sprinklers, extinguishers. And then secondly, we conduct regular preventative maintenance as well, uh, which is where we follow manufacturer recommendations to preserve the life of equipment. So for example, you know, replacing HVAC systems. And then lastly, there's uh, corrective maintenance, which means that the equipment or system in a building is reaching the end of its useful life. And we are you know, essentially doing what we can to keep that system operating. And so as an ongoing and sort of longer term solution to lowering the amount of corrective work that we do, uh, our capital projects team works uh, in close partnership with our facilities team to uh, identify and pursue uh, the needed capital improvement projects every year as well. So, um, there's a lot there, but just to, just to wrap up, DGS is, is really committed to embracing preventative measures um, to reduce the reactive work within our building's portfolio. And uh, we, of course, want to ensure that we have safe and comfortable conditions, both for the city employees that work in these buildings, but also for the members of the public who are frequently in these buildings as well. Um, so I will uh, stop there for now, but again, we are supportive of the bill um, and of the conversation, and our team is happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And next up, we've got the Office of the Comptroller again. If there's any more, anything more to add. I'll defer to my Casey Kelleher, Office of the Comptroller. I'll defer to my previous report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks. Good afternoon, Chairman. I'm Jenny Morgan, the Legislative Liaison for Baltimore City Work and Parks. Um, we stand by our report, which basically focuses on um, our building conditions based on a facility assessment report that we began in 2018. We're trying to, we've prioritized and we're trying to address them. We've done some renovations. Um, we're happy to answer any specific questions you have. And as far as vacant lots, we don't have any assigned directly to the agency, but we do respond to other agency requests for um, work, like forestry. They'll, they'll do an interagency work order and then we'll respond to those. Thank you. And I just want to note, uh, Councilman Glover has joined us. All right, I'll open up the floor to questions and I'll actually turn it over first to the sponsor. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, DPW, how could I forget you guys? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Marsha Collins representing the Department of Public Works and, and as well as Janelle Mummy. Uh, who's back from Annapolis. Uh, and I also, ha also have with me today Mr. Steve Strickland, who is our Chief Operating Officer, and Kedrick McIntyre, who is with the Bureau of Solid Waste. He's Chief of the uh, Property Maintenance Division of Solid Waste. Uh, we provided a written report 
to the committee, uh, and uh, I'm sure you all have it. Um, but I wanted to just point out that we recently uh, established within the department uh, two new offices, one that's de dedicated to the condition of the facilities, uh, facilities maintenance group, and that will be under Steve Strickland's office, and uh, also uh, to conduct safety inspections and compliance, and that office is going to be under our legal team, uh, specifically Andrea Bowie. Um, and what the intent here is, is while we have used the services of the Department of General Services for some of our facilities, particularly yards, uh, in the past, and uh, they would respond when we requested, they would do general maintenance, and then our teams would just do the general cleaning. Um, and then when we needed something like maybe HVAC work, um, we would work with an on-call from DGS. But our intent here is to establish our own uh, proactive uh, programs uh, for facilities maintenance and for safety and compliance inspections. Uh, and we hope in this manner to get to these issues before they come, become problematic. Um, it was my expectation that uh, other than our operational facilities, this committee would be interested in our yards. So we provided in our report the addresses of the yards both for solid waste and water and wastewater. Um, and these are um, the facilities that uh, require a lot of attention. Um, and that became obvious years ago. Um, for solid waste, it's always been an issue about having the kind of capital funding. It's not traditionally uh, receiving capital funding other than for, say, the expansion of Q uh, Quarantine Road Landfill. And so we were very fortunate this fiscal year to get capital funding to address some of these more severe situations. The uh, OSHA issues that we have have been all addressed. We've brought in trailers for areas that are going to take longer to uh, repair. Um, and we're making progress on our capital uh, programs. Uh, so I'll keep it at that, and we'll be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Um, with that, I'll open up the floor and turn it over to the sponsor for questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm not entirely, uh, we see we have Sophia from the mayor's office. I don't know if there's anyone from the CAO or if I guess you would be able to speak on behalf, but I guess broadly speaking, what, is there a the coordinating entity um, sort of at the highest levels that's looking at like the backlog for maintenance across city facilities? and sort of trying to formulate a strategic plan to sort of dig ourselves out of the hole. I'm not sure who can answer that, or if anyone here, president can answer that. If not, I can just follow up. I see Nina, sorry. Thank you, Councilman. Nina Themelis uh, with the Mayor's Office of Government Relations. Yes, the City Administrator's Office has been working with the Department of General Services in um, making a plan to move forward with deferred maintenance. Um, that'll be a part of the upcoming 10-year financial strategic plan, um, but that is a central focus for the city administrator. Okay. And for um, the agencies represented, could you, if you don't have it, it's okay, we can do a, a, a request, uh, but if you could let, let me know for each agency uh, how much capital funding for maintenance the agency is allocated and uh, what the current maintenance backlog is, if you have that number available, or if not, then just let us know and we can, if you could provide it to us following the hearing. Um, I guess we could start with DGS. Um, if it's all right, can we follow up after the hearing to provide that information? Sure. Well, I guess instead of going person, do, do, does any of the, do any of the agencies able to answer that today? Okay. I, I just want to be a, cl a clear, Councilman. Um, so um, we have amounts for uh, addressing maintenance of uh, the solid waste. We can just add them up or give a listing of all the capital projects and give you a, a quick status on each and provide that to you and the committee. Um, the um, a lot of the general maintenance is really not a capital project, it's really more a budgetary uh, pursuit, but we can try to look at how we parse that out, uh, but would appreciate a little bit of time to provide it. Totally fine. 
Um, the other question I had um, for this uh, round was um, for DHCD. Um, the city, obviously, we've we've have a, a depleting number of vacants, which is a good thing. We've been able to drive that down, but there are uh, a number of city-owned vacants. Uh, can you speak to um, the? We often get calls about you know mowing and, and resealing. Can you just speak to like I guess the, the process that DHCD follows for main, maintenance of city-owned vacants um, and sort of again similarly if we could um, follow up with. I guess the estimated backlog of maintenance in the in the buildings as well. I don't expect you to have that here, but if we could follow up with that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative uh, Services and DHCD. Um, so we do know, you know, about 92% of the vacants are privately owned. So of the thousand or so that are um, under DHCD. Uh, we uh, always want to make sure that these buildings are secure and mowed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have some community engagement pieces that we try to encourage the community to help us with, but we also have our inspectors going out and making uh, routine inspections uh, of these properties and making referrals um, to DPW if they find a property is in need of, uh, you know, mowing or, or boarding. So those are some of the, the items that we do as far as the frequency of when those re inspections occur, whether it be 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days, I'd have to follow back up with you. And I, I do want to acknowledge we have some other team members here today that came in, Deputy Commissioner Hessler and Deputy Commissioner Hart are also with us in the audience. Thank you. Still getting used to this. Uh, thank you. I, I, I actually had a question um, similar to, to yours regarding uh, city-owned vacants, but specifically um, formerly municipal, bu uh, municipal buildings like schools or other bu uh, buildings that the city has vacated. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of an instance that I, I dealt with recently where the city uh, had not mowed a formerly, uh, former school. Um, and had super high grass, um, causing you know blight essentially in the neighborhood. How do we how do we think about um, maintenance of former buildings that are now vacant, um, especially ones that we're maybe even looking to sell? Um, are we maintaining those buildings? Um, are we mowing those buildings? Um, just as a perspective from the outside and how folks in the community. Um, we maybe have to deal with high grass for a school that maybe has been vacant for a year or so. How, how do we think about that? Is there someone that can speak to that? Yeah, I'll let um, our real estate agent, Hillary Chester, chime in. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we do have about, about a third of our facilities portfolios made up of these surplus schools, um, which were, you know, of course, former public education facilities deemed no longer adequate for use. Um, and so then they get passed on to DGS, and then we either, you know, demolish them, sell them, you know, renovate them. So I'll let Hillary speak a little bit more to that. Hi. Uh, so right now, DGS has about 18 um, schools in our inventory. And yes, we do mow all of them. Um, we have a service that comes. And unfortunately, you know, just like home, if it rains that day, they don't mow. Um, so they come back in two weeks, and if it rains that day, they don't mow. So it does, it, it, it's a problem, um, but it is, you know, that we're, we're trying to do the best we can. Um, we also try to tackle um, trash and weeds, and, you know, we, we don't have a landscaper per se, but I know that's another issue that we get complaints about. Um, around the, you know, the, the weeds that grow up into the, um, the fencing and that sort of thing. And um, we do have, um, I think Roca has, has done that for us on, on occasion. Um, regarding the rest of the buildings, we are putting layer upon layer of security on them, um, you know, beyond boarding and, and welding the doors shut. We are now putting um, window and door guard systems over them that, you know, are, are hard to pry off. Not impossible, hard to pry off. Um, we are now looking into AI cameras um, to be mounted around the perimeters of the building. So, 
that's what we're doing. Um, we'll just keep doing it. Uh, we have fencing up. Um, so that's what we're doing about those vacant buildings. And we really only have one other that is not a school, and that's, that's, in, um, that's 620 Caroline, and that is in the middle of being sold. We have four school, schools that are under LDA right now. Um, so we hope, expect them to sell as quickly as possible, and we have a couple more that are about to be announced um, that are, that are going to be sold. And we'll be doing more, you know, working with HCD, we'll be doing more, um, you know, uh, RFPs, and, and hopefully we can get, get them sold, so. How often do we check on these schools? So um, we actually have mobile security that check on them every three hours. Um, that that uh, our uh, DGS is security company. Um, it's not they, they're not armed security. They they check the doors, um, windows. If they see anything, um, if they see anything that they need to call the police for, they they call the police and wait until they get there. If it's facilities issue or illegal dumping, they call um, DGS um, FMD directly as, as superintendent. And they'll, then they'll send somebody out. Um, so they're, I mean, they're checked on, you know, that way. Um, and then sometimes we get we get calls from from you know council members or um, community members, and they'll come in. We put in work orders through our archivist system, and we'll send somebody out to check on it. Um, so you know, we check on it that way. We check on it, you know, through our, our security system, which is there every day. Um, so, so um, from a security perspective, we check uh, the 18 schools and the one other site every three hours. Roughly. Well, every three hours from I think it's like it, during it's like six to six or something. It's not during the day. Got it. Um, and then, as far as from a maintenance perspective, it's mo mostly a matter of complaint, or do we have like a maintenance cycle for like I'm thinking high grass and weeds. Um, so knowing the maintenance, that we're going into now the so the, the, mowing, the, the mowing schedule is every two weeks, which is the same for all of our all, okay. all of our buildings. So the community action centers, um, you know, and hopefully it doesn't rain the night before or the day of, um, mm -hmm. because that will put it off for two weeks, which is unfortunate. Um, but but that's you know, and and then as far as the schools go for maintenance, there is we don't have a maintenance budget for schools. Uh, so we we don't do anything in, interiorly of sorts. No. Okay. No, unless the only thing we would do to a school is if it's if it's outside of the facility and it would be, you know, if it's a public health issue of you know because a lot of times you know the community is still using the playground or you know the the grounds in some way. So if it's something like that, we'll fix it. But nothing inside at all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions, Councilwoman uh, Ramos and the board. Yeah, pick up. You all can hear me because I'm not too. Do I have to be right in front of it? Uh, I'm good. Okay, this is cool. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. One is um, uh, just for uh, real quick. I, I wanted to just give a, a sense of um, the the need that DGS still needs to get better at the security of the schools. We saw with Lake Clifton. You know, now that Lake Clifton is in Morgan's hands, it's their responsibility, but the Lake Clifton School, um, it was very difficult to secure just because it is humongous. Um, and uh, yet, you know, that is that can't be a deterrent, however, because we've had horrible things happen in that school um, while it was um, vacant in terms of um, squatters, we've had three fires, and uh, two of the, of the eight art pieces were stolen. Um, and it is a horrific thing for the alumni to under to know that you know pieces of their you know history um, are gone and and they're they were metal so they're gone I'm sure um, so I would just encourage DGS to really think about other you know you've got to step up the security on these facilities um, I don't know if there's public art in the other buildings that you're dealing with like we had at um, Lake Clifton, um, but we do have people who are obviously in need of housing and shelter that are going to utilize these facilities. Um, so I would just urge that, 
what it, it sounds like you're starting to think about some new ways to you know keep these buildings secure um, but it's like super important that um, that that happens um, just given the uh, problem that we had with um, with Lake Clifton um, and then for um, <clears throat> DPW um, on vacant lots um, last budget cycle we learned that um, you only have um, eight crews uh, for mowing all of the vacant lots across the city. Is that still the case? Um, I thought I saw in the budget that there may be an increase in that, but I wanna just make sure. Uh, good afternoon, we currently have uh, 10 crews. Okay. Yes, um, 10 crews and then we uh, work with uh, DCHD uh, with living classrooms and then we also have uh, one contractor that we use to help supplement work. Um, and their crews, the number of crews that they have is kind of dependent on the amount of work that we're giving them. So mm -hmm. the more work that we give them, uh, the more they're able to ramp up what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that last year we also talked about um, looking at potentially getting Project Core funding because Project Core actually was one of the reasons why we have so many vacant lots in the city. Um, and it turns out that uh, at the time that Project Core came about, which was just after the uprising, um, the city at the time signed an MOU with the state saying that the city is only going to be responsible for maintaining the lots and no other state money or state money from Project Core can't go into that. So I looked into that. I know we talked about it. Um, and that's unfortunate because there are so many vacant lots now because of that program. Um, and uh, so I just want to get a sense now that um, obviously we're seeing a lot more um, grass, high grass and weeds all over the place with those vacant lots. You had mentioned that there are 10 crews, that it's 311 driven, but you're also doing proactive, you know, you've got the crews assigned in certain places. Tell us what your strategy is this summer um, to be able to make sure that we're not hearing from our constituents all the time about the vacant lots. Yeah, so, um uh, we, we don't have so much of a proactive schedule right now because there is such a large amount of lots. I think previously we tried to do a pro, uh, we tried to do a schedule of the city owned lots and then we got tons of complaints about the privately owned lots. Uh, so we work with our partners at DHCD. Uh, they do their inspections and uh, they create the work orders and we address them um, within 30 days uh, of them creating the work order. So um, while there is no promo schedule anymore, but we are addressing the work orders as we receive them. Um, and of course the work orders are generated by, um, uh, they do do routine inspections. I'm not, I don't want to speak too much for DCHD, um, but, uh, and then also they are generated by citizens. The inspections are generated by citizens calling 311. So, um, as they're coming in, we're addressing them, assigning the work to our crews, and also assigning work to the contractors. So, however, and this is the same line of questioning, Mr. Chair, um, the if you've got four vacant lots in a row, and you get one, one, one 311, because we're only really putting in one address per 311, is the contractor or your staff going to do, okay, do all four of them? Because all four of them have high grass. So that is, is, is you're not just doing the one that, uh, correct. Um, so we, our crews know to do that, our in-house crews. Uh, we are working with our uh, contractors. They don't always do that because they want to run through the list. They don't want to call the office to make sure it's okay to cut that lot. But um, I actually just met with our contractors this morning just to radiate one of those points. So, um, but they should be cutting the whole lot. Even though you put in one address, um, we can look at a cold map and look at the different plots so they should be cutting the whole lot. Um, I, I, I get that we don't have as many crews as we should but the grass keeps growing every two weeks so there's got to be a way to just know to come out and assign crews to different areas because otherwise it's just spinning our wheels. Have you thought about that kind of proactive approach sort of like what parks does mm -hmm. um, with their parks? Yeah I, I think um, uh, it didn't work too well um, in the parks. Much more control situation. Um, they know what their what, what their properties are. You know, sometimes we get to a property and a, a neighbor has decided to cut the grass. You know, that's that's just their their project. So, I think um, the the work order, the server, the service requests, um, and the inspection. Uh, 
driven work orders uh, works best for what we have right now. Um, if we put our crews on a uh, proactive schedule, um, we wouldn't get to a lot of stuff. So, you know, you may get through the whole summer or the whole cutting season and, you know, one property may be cut just one time over the summer. So, um, we, uh, I, I guess I can see that. Um, do we, I, you know, the Clean Core program in my district has uh, some of those uh, folks that are in Clean Core doing the lots. Is that the case in the other parts of the city to be able to help DPW um, mow the lots? Uh, yes, and I'll, I'll defer to Kim to that, but um, uh, we're working with Clean Corps, uh, and what they'll do, they give us an updated list of the lots that they're responsible for, so uh, we, we don't waste our time going there. We can divert our crews to do other work, so, um, but Kim can speak more to the schedule of uh, how they work. So Kim Knox, Baltimore City Department of Planning. Yes, we have uh, 16 neighborhoods in Clean Corps. Um, the, the each grantee works with the neighborhood leaders to choose uh, what vacant lots and what alleys are cleaned um, on a regular, on a, on a scheduled basis. Um, for example, in CHM, Darley Park, and 4x4, uh, the Civic Works was the grantee went and specifically um, worked with neighborhood leaders to choose the lots and the alleys. Mm -hmm. And they are doing it uh, at, at four days a week. <laughs> each week, thank you. Every yes, it looks amazing. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, I just, I, that's a good way to have been able to do that. I'm worried that, um, you know, Clean Core is only gonna last so long because that's ARPA money, so that we have to have a strategy for um, asking for money to be able to get a lot of the lots uh, taken care of until we can have redevelopment. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of the lots are privately owned, so we're going through the in-rem process to make them city-owned and then um, make them available for redevelopment, but that's not gonna happen tomorrow. So um, I would just encourage uh, DPW to look at, you know, the capacity that you actually need to maintain the lots, because this is the same problem we've had every year. So we need to have a solution. We've got the long-term solution, but a short-term solution to get to the, um, to the vacant lots. Um, I'll, I have some more, but I'll yield. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman Porter. Thank you. As a follow-up to that question, um, one of the things that was coming in my brain was about just having, we have all of the 311s that have been pulled historically for the past one to two to three years. I'm wondering if there can do, be some trend analysis on particular lots that we are kind of going back each week, every two weeks. And from there, you can do a foreshadowing of like what lots you need to do and the timetables associated with it. I do totally get your thought about, you know, the proactive approach and, you know, crews not being able to be nimble if a community member um, cuts the lot. However, if we have a cascading schedule where the inspector goes out two to three days before, 72 hours before, then you have a verification system, then you have a touch point with your contractor. And so creating those types of timelines will definitely help to kind of foreshadow all of the trimming and high grass and weeds that we are historically seeing every month. I know in District 10, we have specific lots that are city owned that we're cutting on a two week schedule time and it just doesn't seem efficient that a work order from a community member has to be submitted every time for that to happen. Yeah, so um, some of those things, um, they, they, they're not necessarily coming or have to come from a community mm -hmm. um, member, but more so DACD and their proactive inspections. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure how they work, but <laughs> I know I do see some stuff coming in there every two weeks or every three weeks. Uh, so they have their cycle in which they put the work in um, and, you know, we go where they go. So, you know, if they have kind of like a proactive schedule, you know, it, it kind of it gets built in. So we don't have a formal proactive schedule, but, you know, if they're visiting this location every two weeks, they're putting in the work orders, we're cutting it. <laughs> 
And I'm wondering, Steph, did you want to say something? Yes. Yes, thank you. Oh, I haven't quite sorry. mastered this. I know, but this is a lot. <laughs> a lot um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the, on the previous question. Um, I was correct about the 30, 60, and 90 day rotation, depending <laughs> on the nature of the, the property. And I, I did want to add that roughly 80% of our uh, work orders are inspector initiated. So when they're out there in the field, just because they didn't get called <laughs> to that particular address doesn't mean that they're not going to um, you know, create a work order for that. And uh, I, I can also have uh, Deputy Commissioner Hessler answer maybe some more specifics about how those work orders are routed. Yeah, and that would be a great, that would be a great thing. And I'm wondering if, because, you know, residents are contacting our office, I'm wondering if there can be some sort of consideration or notification from the agencies of which lots are being cut, how often they're being cut, so that we can track with our constituent services managers, kind of, you know, just closing the loop of communication and coordination from the agencies to the council offices. Yep, just to address the question of how the, the inspectors um, deploy and, and how they address uh, so the housing inspectors respond to 311 requests. They also do reinspections or an open notices, and then they um, drive through or, or patrol areas where uh, it's less likely that 311 complaints are called in, just based on the volume of vacancy or vacant lots and and um, the distress to the area. So they're proactively looking for for those where we don't think we're going to get calls, um, and it's not just. A lot of this is focused around high grass and weeds, but it's not just high grass and weeds. It's also trash dumpings and uh, the work orders get split out um, for planning purposes for DPW into three categories of high grass and weeds only, trash and debris only, or a combination. And then they also get split out into um, sizes, which is somewhat relative, but ones, twos, or threes as to how big of a job it would be with a three being in. A, a large job, and that can help the crews and the managers determine, do I just send a truck with a lawnmower mm -hmm. and, and mow it, or do I need to send the dump truck with uh, you know, another crew behind it and riding mowers and, and bobcats and, and all that stuff. Um, so there has been a lot of thought put behind um, how the inspectors put in the work orders. Um, and I think we can always work with DPW or in, improving strategies as far as deployment and and that kind of stuff and i appreciate that response i'm wondering again if we can take it a step further with communication and engagement with the council's office i think that's kind of where there is lacking communication because we often have to reach out to the agency to get a status update um, and that takes out that takes time out of your schedule instead of having a proactive schedule sending to us so we're not constantly reaching out to you regarding status updates um, because the community is calling us, I'm wondering where is the disconnect? Is it lack of staff? Is it lack of equipment? Is it lack of you know the contracting? Um, not having the whole totality of the need for that particular cycle. Because the only reason why I bring it up is because you know I hear the pro I hear the the approach that's being discussed today, but in reality we're not seeing that type of coordination either from the agency, the contractor, the notes that are reflected in Salesforce, or um, the communication to our offices. Yep. Yeah. Um, I can say that we, we do um, put cleaning work order data on code map, so that is something that can be tracked to see whether or not a work order is open on a property, and it's, I can't remember the exact breakdown, but it breaks down into three different categories for age of when the work order was created. So there is some transparency there. Um, all of our work orders, while created in our internal system and shared with DPW, are also shared with the 311 system. So um, a search of that address would show that um, the property has or doesn't have a, a cleaning work order on it and um, when that work order was created. Um, we. HCD inspectors respond to um, all of their SR requests within um, under four days. Um, I think the average is like 3.4 days. And that includes holidays and weekends. So we are, when a resident calls, we are getting out there, um, you know, immediately and assessing the situation. If a notice is needed, creating a notice. If it's more appropriate for a citation, issuing a citation. 
and then creating a work order to have um, the property cut or cleaned or, or whatever's needed. Um, so those are things we're currently doing, and, and I hear what you're saying as far as communication. And as far as from the previous budget cycle, I know that um, Deputy, <laughs> Deputy Director Booker um, mentioned that um, there were some there were some inspector uh, vacancies. Have you all addressed those in the upcoming budget to get more inspectors to kind of help out? I know there was a lag in inspectors. Yeah, I I think that um, with with um, Deputy Commissioner Booker was talking about was the need to fill open positions. It's not so okay. much unbudgeted positions as it's just open positions. difficult to hire. And, and what do you all, what strategies are you doing to recruit? Um, I'd have to get back to you on that because that, that is a different shop, but. Okay. Yeah, we, we were just at the citywide job fair um, last week and, and these are open positions uh, that we are trying to fill. So okay. we can get yeah. back to you with exactly where we are on filling those. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. It's Thanks so much. a difficult position to attract people to and then when we do get a class and we go through the training, I think Chief Booker always says this, it's just difficult to um, retain. retain the people yeah. and, and get them through the process. Mm -hmm. um, and w big struggle is um, they get trained and go someplace else, but even mm -hmm. through the training, um, they, they don't make it through or they fail a drug test. Mm -hmm. And and that's, um, I think his last class was like seven or eight people yeah, and it dropped down to like and two. I visited them. And so that's why I'm asking like what yeah. happened to that seven to 10 group of young professionals that he had, are they being onboarded? What what was the status of those? It was like 10 people. Yeah, and I think he only, in the end, only had a couple that okay. made it through the, the end of the process. I don't have the exact number, but we can get that for you. Okay. Um, and Mr. Chair, may I ask one more question? Go for it. Um, when we talk about, for DGS, when we talk about the security of buildings, another thing, just to kind of follow up on Councilwoman Ramos's question regarding the security of buildings, how are you all working with school police um, to kind of integrate and make sure that these school buildings that are vacant are being locked down because what ends up happening is that there's a jurisdictional issue between school police, BPD, and DGS. And so I'm trying to figure out if you can share what that, um, what that designated person or designated jurisdiction that is on tap to provide the security to those buildings that we are experiencing in our communities. Good afternoon. Well, currently we do not work at all with the Baltimore City School Police, but our mobile patrol, which patrol from 3 p.m. to 7 a.m., they will call Baltimore Police Department if they do see, let's say, an open window, an open door. And so we, but to answer your question, no involvement whatsoever with the Baltimore City School Police. Okay, so I recommend if there if there is some opportunity there to coordinate because just myself and my district, I have one school that is slated to close and then one school that is currently vacant that we've been receiving many calls from the community about um, squatters being in there, persons right. experiencing homelessness, um, young people getting into the building and, and doing things. And so I'm wondering if there can be some synergies there between the agencies. Well, what we are doing now is we're having a more proactive um, look into the transferring of the schools. Okay. So not just getting a school to close and getting a set of box of keys dropped off to DGS. <laughs> yes. We're trying to make that transfer more seamless in okay. security as far as them not stopping the closed circuit television mm -hmm. immediately upon leaving or at least allowing us the opportunity to have a transition to a, a, a visual monitoring system of our own that reports. So we're also looking at that not only for the transfer of the schools future transfers, but for the ones that we do have now. Okay. But the funding, of course, is one of the major hurdles that we have to overcome, and we're also looking at and have used what the particular manufacturers call dogs. Mm -hmm. It's a security that. system yep. yes. that is supposed to prevent, mm -hmm. but they've found ways of getting around that. 
yeah. intrusion system as well. In other cities, I know that they're using drone technology to kind of like go into the buildings um, proactively to kind of look around, assess the situation. I'm wondering, and I know funding is a significant um, hurdle for a lot of the agencies, but what in my brain, I'm wondering if there can be interagency agreements developed with like the Baltimore City Police Department and or some other agency where the costs for that type of technology is shared since all of the agencies, DPW, DCHD, DGS, BPD, are touching that particular task. I'm wondering if there can be some cost sharing associated. Well, we will have to talk about that. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Can I, I can. So um, just to speak to that, so mm -hmm. we already coordinate with um, BPD mm -hmm. as much as possible. So sometimes they will, they will swing by the schools, um, especially like we, we did that with Lake Clifton. We asked them, you know, as, as much as possible to, um, to, you know, patrol the area. Um, sometimes we will have them do, uh, do a sweep of the building with us. Um, because sometimes we do need to enter, enter the building for, you know, for legitimate reasons. And, we'll, you know, we don't feel like we want to send our, our people in there. Mm -hmm. And we know that people are getting in there. And sometimes it's, you know, it's homelessness, it's, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not. So um, we, we're already coordinating. Um, a, a, as for other agencies, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, I, I don't, I, that, that would be a tough battle. I don't yeah. know um, how we would do that. You know, the the measures that we are trying to get in place for all of the schools mm -hmm. would be about $100,000 annually mm -hmm. per school. Mm -hmm. And about 25, and that's, per, that's an average cost, and it would be about $25,000 per school for the fencing that we're using. Okay. So, um, so annually, that's for 18 schools. That's yeah. 2.3 million. Okay. Um, and that's just for that's just for the security measures. That mm -hmm. doesn't include the the mowing and the cleaning and mm -hmm. and if we have you know electricity and plumbing still in these schools, we we keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. That's our intention. Um, if it's if it's available, so um, you know that that's and it's not cheap. Yeah. Um, we want to keep the, the lights on. So. Um, <laughs> you know, that, you know, that's another expense altogether. So um, we, you know, we would love to share the cost with somebody, but, yeah. you know, or get more funding, but. And I recommend that, you know, one of the things that I've shared throughout, you know, my last couple of months is really ensuring that agencies are being transparent about the budget needs that they actually need. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know if you don't ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, right. you know, I understand that you all go through a budget process, Sophia, with the administration. Um, I believe that that process, process needs to be a little bit more transparent. Um, so that the council members can make an informed decision about some of the line items such as this young lady she mentioned um, because if I recall correctly that was not even included in right. you all's budget for this cycle is that correct am some, I missing something some of it was and some mm -hmm. of it wasn't I, I, I'll be honest with you a lot of our issues have been procurement issues ah. so we and in the past years it, you know I we, the argument has been well, we're giving you money and you're not spending it. And we're trying, believe me, we're, we're trying, but it's just, it, we're having issues getting, getting the money spent. Procurement now, so procurement yeah. is the bottleneck, that's what you're saying. It, yes, okay. so, so I don't have fences on every school. I yeah. don't have the dogs on every school. I'm yeah. trying to, yeah. so right now I'm kind of choosing, you know, and it's hard because right now I'm, I, do I choose the school that's getting the most complaints or do mm -hmm. I choose the school that still has its plumbing and electric mm -hmm. because it still has some value? You know, like, I don't know, like, which, what do yeah. I do? So um, th that those are tough, you know, it's a tough yeah, call. But I think, I think, you know, there's a balancing effect here because you can, you know, balance it within the budget. But I think that having those line items transparently shared with the council members, right. we're able to ask those types right. of questions during budget hearings. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is, how are you all working with MOHS? I don't know if they are represented we, here. We, are working with them. Okay. So um, we had a, an instance um, at Westside, which, mm -hmm. and I don't know that, I can't remember the name of the rec center that was there, but um, they, it, 
Rex is actually going to tear it down and, and put a new rec center there. Mm -hmm. And it's on Fulton Avenue, like right at Druid Hill Park. Mm -hmm. um, and we had actually a family living there. I think it was a woman and, and some two young children. And we sent Mo's in and, and they worked for, you know, several days to get, get them shelter. Um, and then we, we went in with, with Rex because they are trying to get demo funding mm -hmm. And they didn't feel comfortable going in. There, there were more than there, there was a lot of people in there, and um, and they they got them out. Um, you know, they got the you know some of them rehomed. Um, some of them, you know, they just let them know that we're coming in, and, and they did. The um, police came and they did a sweep. Mose was there, and um, and we did a you know full sweep of the building. So and Rex was there, and DGS FMD was there. So um, we are working with them, and you know. We do what, you know, they'll do as much as they can yeah. sometimes and, you know. And the only reason why I bring that up is because we're noticing in our empty lots that do have high grads and weeds, we're noticing persons experiencing homelessness, establishing tents. Um, they are setting their, their homes there in these vacant lots. And right. so that's an added layer of coordination that with housing, DPW, DGS that that's that's going to have to be addressed very soon and it seems to be an uptick as we're seeing in our neighborhoods right so thank right. you so much mr. chair <clears throat> thank you councilman Cohen um, thank you mr. chair and uh, thank you to all the folks here and apologies for eating this is dad life when you have to eat breakfast slash lunch at a hearing um, but if anyone wants a shrimp just let me know um, this is a rec and park question. Uh, and I, I really want to talk a little bit about prevention versus reaction. Um, because I think that what happens with a lot of our older buildings, which is most of our buildings, we have a lot of very old aging buildings in the city, is that they slowly over time degrade and fall apart and ultimately fail and then we have to um, not just, it's no longer maintenance, it's now about having to essentially resurrect a building that is falling apart and inoperable. That is exactly what happened at the casino at Patterson Park. Uh, this is, a, again, a very old building. It is, it is used by our seniors. It's a senior center. It's in the middle of the park. It's amazing. The programming in there is beautiful. Um, but over time, it degraded and uh, fell apart, and the proper maintenance was not done. And then I believe there was a flood, and as a result, um, for the past couple of years now at this point, it has been inoperable. And that's a huge loss to our elders. Um, we did start, like my colleagues were saying, to see some homeless encampments um, in and around the building. Um, but it's just, so sort of disappointing to see that and experience that because it was such a lifeblood for older adults in our communities. And I think it is going to be far more expensive. I know that we are in talks about procuring the parts that we need to fix it at this point, but I'm willing to bet that it'll be much more expensive to do that than it would have been to just do the maintenance. So I'm wondering, what, I don't know if this is Rec and Park or um, DGS, but just how are we thinking about um, sort of prevention and maintenance as a tool to keep us from getting into the catastrophic situations that we often find ourselves in where a building becomes so degraded that it then can't be used by the public and as a result needs I think a very expensive and timely, um, time intensive renovation. I'm not sure there's a specific question, but. Um, how, how, sorry, I, let, I, me, let, so, let me, yeah, let me reframe that. Sorry, I, I realized that was not specific. So, how do we think about prevention in terms of not allowing our public assets to degrade to the point where they're no longer operable? and we end up spending more to fix them up instead of just doing what we should have done all along, which is put in the necessary maintenance. Yeah, well, speaking specifically about the flood at the casino, 
that was an issue that would not have been caught by any type of preventive maintenance pr program because it was a failed elbow in the sprinkler system. And it came loose during the King holiday weekend, which caused for the massive amount of water to run for such a long period of time. So for that specific site, preventive maintenance would not have caught that because it was above ceiling. But, but all right. Mm -hmm. But let me, let me get back to that, but mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. No, so we're right now, understanding your concern with the homeless situation, we did work closely with Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, removed and offered services. We put a construction fence around, and we are currently putting the building back together, starting with the sprinkler system, getting it certified, elevators getting it certified, and then, and we're after those systems are complete and inspected, then we're going to go forth with the renovation. No, and look, I appreciate that. Um, that's not my question, though. Okay. And I, I would actually argue uh, just the opposite, which is there were multiple warning signs that the sprinkler system was going to fail along the way. We've had that happen before at that building, not to the point where it did, and then we lost the building for a couple of years, but at, there, I've been in city council six plus years. That has happened more than once, and, and so it, 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 we have had water issues more than once. But right, so only so, one with that. The others were HVAC. But right, so what I'm saying point, is, why didn't we the first time it happened? The second time, we know these buildings are aging. Why aren't we doing like to me? That is what prevent preventive maintenance means. It means when we start to see the building is starting to fail, instead of getting to the point where it's now a flood and the whole thing has to be offline for multiple years. It, it just seems like it would have been, again, cheaper and better for the public to have stepped in earlier. And so the question that I'm trying to articulate is how do we think about prevention versus reaction, which is when we end up with a building that's been dead for over a year? Yeah, well, ultimately your preventive maintenance is how we prevent corrective and catastrophic floods from happening. But there are some things that will occur just as that did. Um, there are some systems that can detect water intrusion, and so we are actually looking at those so that when we don't have eyes in a particular facility during the middle of the night or on a long weekend, that we can get notification that the humidity has risen so we need to respond. There may be an active water leak. Okay. Now, so those and I, things, funding. And I appreciate that. And I did not mean to just go down the rabbit hole of this one building in my district. Really, I want sort of a broader analysis of how we prevent, like, what are the checkpoints along the way mm -hmm. that we can see a building is starting to fail, and so therefore we need to update the sprinkler system, update the HVAC, update whatever it is. Like, do we have uh, checkpoints? Do we do any kind of like yearly analysis of our, our infrastructure, of our buildings? Um, because it's not just the casino. I, I, I get it with that one. But generally, I think we have a ton of old buildings in our city. And the point I'm trying to make is I think it will be cheaper and better to just put in the money earlier on to fix it versus allowing it to degrade and degrade and degrade and then have to come offline. Well, DGS is in agreement with your statement, and so we, we, those are our, that's our mission to have that happen. But of course, as we stated earlier, no need to beat a dead horse about funding and the procurement process, but those are some of our, our hurdles that we have to overcome in our day-to-day -day operations and also the maintenance of the facilities long-term. But we are and so doing when, those analysis to develop those programs, to your point. And so when people are putting in the 311s and we're getting them constantly, there's no trigger point at which we say, like, oh, there, there must be something pretty serious here. Well, DGS doesn't deal with 311. Okay. We deal with the Archibus system, in which each agency has an SRL, a service request liaison, and they input service tickets. But in, in addition to that, we do have preventive maintenance schedules that we have that are automatically generated for those systems that you just mentioned, sprinkler, elevator, extinguisher, 
and of the like. So you don't get the, th you, you don't get, the, how do the three one ones get processed, like if it is a building maintenance issue? We don't get three one one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question, but I'll ask on a later round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Glover, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the agencies that are here today. Um, this question is out for, uh, for planning. Um, can you kind of explain to me exactly uh, what is the protocol for, like, those that are part of the Clean Core program? Um, exactly what is the ask of them? And how do we, as council members, actually are able to find out the data in which those properties or neighborhoods and alleys are being cleaned as opposed to the ones that are not? Because some of them are going through 311 in the city of Baltimore, DPW is picking them up, and then some of them are giving out to the Clean Core program. But there's miscommunication between uh, us as council members, as opposed to what you guys are sending out, you know, I guess with DPW Solid Waste or Solid Waste giving information to you, we don't get any uh, information. But the constituents are continuously calling us, asking, you know, why our alleys aren't being cleaned, and a lot of these properties and these alleys are in the uh, areas for the Clean Core program. Thank you, um, Councilman McGovern. So, again, there's it's 16 neighborhoods. Uh, there's the community members with the grantees choose the specific alleys and lots that they're cleaning. So they're not responding from 311, they're doing a proactive cleaning on a regular schedule. So we meet with the DPW on a bi-weekly basis to communicate between the two. Um, the, we don't, we, we respond if the 311 is on that, that, that lot we're cleaning each time but the 311 responses are given, or are, are, are the, is DPW is in terms of the 311s for, for, for the area, the, the 311s in, within the area. Where the Clean Corps is, uh, grantees are specifically cleaning the lots and the alleys that were chosen by the community when they met with them, because they had to have, in order to apply, you had to have a relationship with the neighborhood association. Like, for example, in your area. Broadway East. Broadway East is working with two neighborhoods, Broadway East. And Midway. And East Baltimore, Midway, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so how often do you planning meet with the Clean Core program? Every, to get they're, they're required to do it week, weekly. Okay, on Fridays, correct? Um, it depends on when, what's best for the grantee. So they, they week with, meet with them on a schedule that works for the grantee. We then have a monthly meeting, um, and that's the second, th third Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, and then we, are, you know, we also communicate weekly with the neighborhood leaders. Okay, and how often do planning go out to make sure that these uh, issues, these issues that are taking place or that is given you know, to you guys to make sure that they're taken care of? So they're to, they're to do site, the site, um, site audits on a monthly basis, and then we do a three-month evaluation, um, and then we also uh, look at, they're supposed to, each time they go to a lot or an alley, they need to do a daily report, and that means they do a pre and a post photo, and then so we're calling, asking in terms of there's something we see in terms of the pre and post photos on the daily reports. And then they also are required to put in a weekly report and to look in terms of what the tonnage is for what they've done that week. Okay, so you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of DPW, solid waste. I wanna make sure our neighborhoods sure. are clean and things of, of that nature. But um, I'm there for the Clean Core programs. Okay. And in the beginning, I was for the Clean Core programs. Okay. But now I'm actually witnessing what it is that the Clean Core programs are doing. And they're not doing what I thought they would be doing in the beginning. Okay. I don't see, you know, planning coming to do site visits with them because I'm there as well. Okay. I'm also helping them clean as well. Okay. Uh, when they come through the gateways in the neighborhoods, to me it doesn't make sense for them to clean out the trash can from the gateways, but the trash that's around the gateways, they're not picking it up. So I was told that 
from planning perspective, you guys were telling them that they, can, they cannot pick up anything other than the gate waves. So it makes no sense, again, for them to pick up the gateway, and if you have multiple uh, bags surrounded that gateway trash can, that they can't pick it up. It still is an eyesore in our community. I'm also told that when they go through the alleys, and I ask why wasn't uh, certain parts of the alley taken care of, from my perspective, what I'm being told is that you guys are telling them what they can and what they cannot pick up. And I don't know, is it a liability issue, meaning uh, they picking up something to the point where somebody's calling, uh, planning and saying, hey, they removed the trash bag, which wasn't a trash bag, it was something else. And now the city is being responsible for paying back like something that was not trash. Is that the reason why? I just need to know those answers because I'm out and about. I'm with these guys and I'm sure. watching what they're sure. doing. Sure. And they are not doing what I thought they would be doing in the beginning. And now what I'm seeing is that, to me, mm -hmm. uh, that if this was given, even this part of the program was given to Solid Waste, DPW, along with those crews, right. I know for sure that these lots and these alleys are going to be taken care of. What I'm saying now is I'm not seeing them getting taken care of, and I'm right there witnessing it in real time. And so that's why I ask the questions of sure. how often do you guys come visit, because I don't see you guys there. Okay. All right. I do see that at times that you come in on a Friday, I guess, for a site visit to, I guess, get numbers of things of that nature. But I also talk to the crews and I ask them, why are you picking up certain items? And they're being told they cannot pick up certain items. So to me, right. it's a failure for the program. Okay. Unless you can provide for me something totally different that I could see when I've already seen it for the last couple of weeks. Okay. So I, I know that I spoke to. Um to, to Dr. Minor Terrell yes. about in terms of the trash, and we spoke that the the area around the the trash can is supposed to be picked up, not only mm -hmm. the trash from the trash can. The question was in terms of large sacks that, that are waiting for uh, pickup. So um, I I said that they should be picking up all around. So thank you for bringing that up, and I will go back um, for for both our program manager as well as for um, the grantee. Um, I, I, was, I speak with them every, every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so I will uh, thank you for bringing that up and we'll, we'll, we'll address I, I just want to make sure we have that, like that, that, that communication because um, DPW is coming out and probably asked to not pick up certain things sure. that Clean Corps program is supposed to be picking up. But what I'm hearing is that Clean Corps program are telling us Look, they're telling us DPW is supposed to be picking it up, so we can't touch it. No, I, that I didn't. I, that's thank you for providing that information. I was not aware that it, that in, that we have been giving that information. When I spoke to that grantee, they didn't provide that. But I I will find that out, and thank you for raising that up, and we will get it cleared up. Okay, and just let them know that I am out there, oh, so I'm I'm that. also riding the alleys, and I'm looking. So I, I need them to be present because you know we're going to come to this conversation again and again I'm pro you know getting these young men and women to you know get to work in. and maybe that's our training program for them to become city employees right but the way we're doing it now is just to me and as I see is not working and it's a waste to me of taxpayers dollars I, I appreciate those comments and we will we will um, speak with the grantee and then we'll get back to you okay thank you Stepping in uh, as the temporary chair, uh, are there any other questions? On, from any? Okay. Um, I did have uh, one more. Um, this is for um, Marsha DBW. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, the OSHA issues that arose in some of the facilities. Can you just give us a, a picture of what was going on and where we stand currently uh, with facility repairs at uh, the DB, DBW facilities? could probably get you a, a list of what they were, but um, I do know that um, there was a list at a number of locations and that all of those things on those OSHA lists had been taken care of, uh, either by correcting it physically or in some cases, depending on the building, uh, bringing in a trailer. It's for example, if they wanted to be assured that there were functioning toilets, that kind of thing. If it was quicker to bring in a functioning trailer, that's what we've done to correct it while we try to get the long-term capital projects taken care of. But if you would like, I'll get a follow-up for you on all of those issues identified. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ramos. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just following up on that, um, Ms. Collins, um, I thought in the last budget we actually had a significant amount of money uh, going into our um, many of our facilities already. Um, so do we think that, I'll just pick Sisson Street because it's the one that um, I know the most. I think that Sisson Street is one that's slated to be redone because the facilities there have been pretty bad, but I mean, the, the um, you know, employees do the best that they can. So uh, do we, I guess with the information you're to provide to the committee, just give us sort of a timeline of when those facilities will be um, uh, updated? That would be super. Because I did see, I was happy to see like $10 million last capital budget, and I believe another 10 this capital budget to be able to start to work on those. It would be great to actually get that work going. Yes, ma'am. Um, the uh, capital projects, um, were significantly increased for the first time in a long time in this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the process of getting those off the ground and some of them have already started. Uh, some re uh, require some design work before we do the actual construction. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but I will be glad to provide that running total and, and show you what we've done so far. Um, a lot of the OSHA work was really uh, more of the general maintenance issues that needed to be addressed, ASAP, and that'll be the other list that I'll supply to, uh, to you both and to the committee. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, and then my last question is back to D um, DGS. Um, you mentioned about the mowing that, you know, if someone, if it rains and the contractor doesn't come back for two weeks, I have never heard of that happening. I mean, I thought that maybe that if it's a rain date, they come the next day. Like, we don't do that with parks, right? If it rains, we're gonna mow it the next day, correct? Correct. So how is it that we're doing this differently in? Well, we are not. Mm -hmm. we, if you look in clean stat, if you have access to that, which we report to for OPI, mm -hmm. You'll notice that we have a cut date designated to each one of our facilities every other week, every two weeks, and you'll you'll see that we haven't missed. And if we do, there is a rain day. They'll come. If let's take for example, if it rains three straight days, we'll make notation of the day that it was cut in relation to the proposed cut date and a note. It was rain. Let's take for example, this past weekend, we cut all of our facilities in that northwest area early so that the city properties would have a certain appearance during Preakness. Mm -hmm. And so, no, if it's a rain day, it's cut so, close proximity. So we don't meant, skip a cycle. We never do. Okay, so, so what meant, was mentioned earlier doesn't happen. It so doesn't, no. It, so Sorry for that. rains on a Tuesday when you were supposed to mow, you come back on a Thursday. Yes, and we'll, and make, no, we'll make that notation in the track or from OPI. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I had never heard of the waiting a whole new. Two no, we weeks, don't. Because that no. would be high grass and weeds would be an issue then. Yeah, yes. Right. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Seeing no questions, we are going to move on to public testimony. Um, so we'll take. Public testimony um, for folks that are here. Do we have a sign up sheet? Uh, no, one signed up. no one signed up. If you would like to testify, please feel free to stand up and approach the podium. Uh, do we have anybody online? Uh, we have folks online. No one's raised their hand. So if you would like to testify and you're joining us virtually, please use the right, uh, raise hand function and we'll acknowledge you, unmute you, and give you two minutes to speak if you'd like to. Give another 10 seconds. All right, uh, public testimony is closed. Um, what about this? Sure. All right, so we're going to bring this back. Um, and for now, we're just going to go ahead and recess, and we'll bring it back given a lot of the questions that we've had today. Uh, with that, this hearing is recess, and we'll move on to our next hearing. Um, we'll recess until uh, 225 just to give folks an opportunity to clean up.
start our next hearing. All right, so our next hearing. Thank you. Uh, our next hearing is going to be on, excuse me, we're going to get started. Thank you. Our next hearing is going to be on uh, resolution, um, excuse me, on Bill 23-0378, unlawful practices, discrimination based on characteristics or status for the purpose of extending certain protections against discrimination to individuals regardless of the individual's HIV or AIDS status, other characteristics or status, or association with individuals with a particular characteristic or status, prohibiting the willful use of the incorrect name or pronouns of an individual under certain circumstances, requiring a certain notice be posted in certain facilities, and generally relating to discrimination based on the individual's protected status. This bill was sponsored by Councilmember Burnett, uh, and I will turn it over to Councilman Burnett for an open statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, so, I was trying to figure out where to start here. Um, we just covered a lot of ground in the last hearing. All right, so the, this bill, uh, I think, is very timely. Um, we have seen uh, across the country a rise in hate crimes against the LGBTQAI plus community. Um, and that is, has manifested in both physical violence and uh, removal of resources, um, discrimination in housing and healthcare, uh, there are attacks underway. And so we felt that it was important for Baltimore City to take a stand, uh, the council to take a stand and be proactive in our efforts uh, to protect all residents of Baltimore, regardless of their gender identity um, and, or expression. Uh, and so this bill is a uh, essentially adding into uh, the, I think it's Article 4 uh, of the City Code, which speaks generally about uh, prohibitions around um, discrimination in employment, public accommodations, education, healthcare, welfare agencies, and housing. Um, and it's adding in language uh, that speaks to, um, adding in language that speaks to being able to use restrooms, to uh, not ha be subject to people willfully using the wrong pronouns or the wrong names. Um, it also uh, goes into increasing uh, or re removing discrimination or uh, making, uh, making it unlawful to discriminate in housing and healthcare um, for either your gender, your gender identity uh, or expressions uh, and also HIV AIDS status as well. Uh, and so, um, and the reason we need this, I, I think, is important. And I did have a couple stats, if I could have a second uh, on this, and then I'll go into sort of a, I thought the, the summary of the bill was pretty good, so I'll just go through that. Um, but LGBTQAI plus individuals are often targeted for hate crimes. According to FBI statistics, uh, out of all reported hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation bias, approximately 60% were targeted to gay men, 24% to lesbian women, 12% bisexual individuals, and 2% against uh, individuals with other sexual orientations. But I would note that those are crimes that have been reported and tracked. Um, but a lot of these things that we're trying to address in this bill go unreported every day. Um, there's also issues with employment discrimination. Um, and uh, there was a 2020 report by the Human Rights uh, campaign foundation that found that 46% of LGBTQAI workers in the United States remain closeted at work due to fear of discrimination. Uh, and moreover, 33% uh, of LGBTQAI plus employees reported experiencing some form of employment discrimination, such as being passed over for promotions, receiving negative comments about their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, housing, uh, the National LGBTQ Task Force 2020 report uh, noted that 27% of transgender and non-conforming individuals experience housing discrimination in the United States, uh, including being evicted or denied housing due to their gender identity. Uh, this also manifests in healthcare. Uh, the American, American Journal of Public Health in 2017 reported that uh, trans individuals are more likely to report fair or poor health status uh, compared to cisgendered individuals. 
Uh, additionally, uh, LGBTQ AI individuals face challenges accessing gender affirming care and healthcare resulting in health disparities. Um, and this also manifests in youth as well, uh, LGBTQ youth. Um, there was a national survey done in 2021 that reported 42% of LGBTQ AI youth uh, seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year uh, with discrimination and victimization being significant contributing factors. Uh, and so I think that speaks to as many, many more reasons as to why we should be taking these steps. Um, but I think that those are a few that really rise to the top um, and need to be noted for the purposes of this hearing. Um, I did want to talk about what the bill does. Um, and I'm just going to, this is from the bill report. I thought they, whoever wrote this did a pretty good job uh, summarizing the bill. Um, so I'll start from page two where, you know, it provides that it's unlawful for health and welfare agencies, uh, housing, employment agencies, et cetera, um, to um, deny admission to a facility, uh, transfer or deny, deny transfer with the facility to another facility or discharge or evict an individual uh, based on their gender identity or HIV status or race, gender. I mean, there's a, there's a whole list in, this, in the article four that uh, we're basically adding to. Um, it uh, denies, you cannot uh, deny an individual uh, who wants to share a room in a facility. Uh, you cannot refuse to assign a room aligning with a trans person's gender identity or reassign them to a room contrary to their identity unless requested by the individual if rooms are assigned by a gender in the facility. Uh, it prohibits an individual from using, uh, prohibits blocking individuals from using restrooms that conform to their gender identity. Uh, it prohibits harassment of individuals because they use a restroom conforming with their gender identity. Uh, the bill also um, addresses uh, the uh, willful and repeatedly using an individual's incorrect name or pronouns after they have been clearly informed of the correct name and pronouns. I will, I will note that we do have uh, a amendment um, that addresses some of the potential First Amendment issues, and I think the law department may speak to that. Um, that'll clear that, that section up a little bit. Um, it, it prohibits denying an individual the right to wear or be dressed in clothing, accessories, cosmetics that are allowed for any other individual. Uh, it prohibits um, any restrictions uh, to the right of an individual to associate with others, including um, consensual sexual relationships, unless the restriction applies uniformly to all individuals. I know this stuff is like super technical, but we're trying to squeeze it into a very technical part of the, of the code. Um, it also prohibits uh, denying or restricting medical or non-medical care. Uh, and it also uh, restricts um, the, any ability to block uh, for medical care or non-medical care in a manner that demeans an individual's dignity or causes affordable discomfort. I thought we're, that was a good summary of what the bill does, um, and I can stop there. Uh, and we do have amendments that were circulated this morning. There was an additional technical amendment that was sent to e via email uh, during the last hearing um, that just reasserts some of where the, de the definitions are supposed to be, but once we get there, I'll go through all of the amendments. So thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, I appreciate you. It looks like we're having some issues with the feed. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to agency reports, starting with the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. Good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tyler Chanel, I represent the um, Office of Equity and Civil Rights. Um, we reviewed City Council Bill 23-0378, um, and it is of the opi um, opinion of our office that um, its implementation has the potential to enhance the overall well-being of people in Baltimore City who have been diagnosed with HIV um, or AIDS, um, as well as their respective allies, um, and we endorse the favorable committee report. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got the Office of the Sol Solicitor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Teresa Cummings on behalf of the City Solicitor's Office. Um, the law department approves the bill for form and legal sufficiency subject to, I believe it's now five amendments. I'm only going to speak to three of them. Um, amendments one and three pretty much cover the same issue regarding the words associated with an association with an individual with certain characteristics or status. Um, the, the amendments were necessary because the words associated with and association with 
are too vague and would be subject to one's own interpretation and or guessing as to the meaning of the words. Um, word usage has to be explicit so that those who must follow the rule clearly understand the rule and understand who it applies to. Um, amendment four refers to page six under the notice requirement for health and welfare agencies. Um, the bill states that the notice shall contain information about filing a complaint with the Community Relations Commission. Um, however, that wording is actually um, essentially redundant because the Community Relations Article 4 of the Baltimore City Code, Section 4.1, spells out the enforcement procedures um, very detailed over six pages. Um, and so it's not necessary to um, include that information regarding the notice in the bill. Um, just to briefly touch on other aspects of um, the Law Department's bill report. Um, the Law Department research determined there's no federal or state preemption um, regarding laws prohibiting discrimination based on a person's protected status. Um, federally, Title VII applies, um, and Title VII is designed to supplement, not supplant, local laws. Um, as for the state, again, there's no preemption. The Maryland Code covers discrimination, um, and we found no statutes or case law preventing local governments from enlarging upon state provisions. Um, in fact, in 2020, Montgomery County enacted a similar law as to discrimination um, in public accommodations, nursing homes, and other facilities. Um, I would also like to mention that laws across the state um, are varied as it relates to gender and the use of restrooms available to other individuals of the same gender identity. Um, as of right now, there's no clear path forward, um, no case law has emerged, and therefore um, the provision regarding restroom use could be challenged in court. Um, likewise, the same is true for the use of preferred pro pronouns. Um, courts have not yet addressed the issue, and again, there is the risk the provision could be challenged in court. However, the EEOC has found it to be a prohibited act to intentionally and persistently fail to use the name and gender pronoun that corresponds to the person's gender identity. Um, so again, the Law Department approves the bill for form and legal sufficiency. Um, subject to the amendments which you all have received. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up we have the Department of Human Resources. Good afternoon. My, uh, first, for the record, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Larissa Parrish, and I'm here as a representative for... You can, I think you can actually move the mic a little closer. My name is Larissa Parrish. I'm from the Office of Policy. You don't have to hold it. <laughs> I'm from the Office of Policy and Compliance with the Department of Human Resources, and I'm representing the director today. Um, the Department of Human Resources supports uh, the bill. Um, it, there's always, uh, we currently have a number of protections within city code, uh, memorandums of understanding, as well as uh, the administrative manual with respect to sexual harassment and EEOC um, specifically. But, however, there's always room to do more. And it's also especially important that you have uh, the ability and the tools to be able to create a diverse workforce, to be able to have that workforce feel comfortable where they work in order to retain those employees and to provide the best service to Baltimore City residents. Um, first, our current uh, administrative manual uh, includes language specific to gender identity in the EEOC policy. It does not specifically mention HIV or HIV status, but we know that HIV and HIV status is considered a disability under the ADA, but it's not specifically noted like gender identity is in our current policy. Um, as we did our research uh, in 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that gender identity as well as sexual orientation are protected under sex discrimination. And then in June of 2021, the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission issued some technical assistance to give more guidance on what that meant. And they specifically discussed the issue with the restroom case in Lasardi. And the language that came out of that case 
was that the they referenced um, transgender uh, persons by incorrect gender pronouns. And essentially, the guidance states that intentionally and repeatedly using the wrong name and pronouns to refer to a transgender employee could contribute to an unlawful, hostile work environment and could violate Title VII. In a variety of different jurisdictions, as the law department already noted, they have different laws and different ways of how they have tucked these terms into their discrimination, laws, uh, discrimination statutes. In Iowa, Maryland, New Jersey, New Mexico, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Vermont, and the District of Columbia, the non-discrimination statutes specifically uh, include gender identity as a protective characteristic. In Colorado, Illinois, Minnesota, Maine, Oregon, and Washington, their non-discrimination laws prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and include gender identity or expression within the, de staff, the statutory definition of sexual orientation. We have some others as well. 12 states, specifically California, Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Minnesota, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington, as well as DC. Uh, prohibit discrimination against transgender people in employment. All of these laws protect employees and job applicants from harassment, demotion, dismissal, and any other unfair employment practice based on the person's transgender status or gender nonconformity. In addition, we also have the State of Maryland's Commission on Civil Rights, and under Article 2602, they've also given um, guidance where Every Marylander is guaranteed the equal opportunity in receiving employment and in all labor, management, union relations, regardless of race, color, religion, ancestry, or national origin, sex, age, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, or genetic, inf genetic information. As we continue to do our research to see other jurisdictions that set up uh, statutes like this, um, one of the things that we noted was that many of the jurisdictions that have these set up have specific commissions also set up to be able to enforce these violations and to enforce the penalties. So there's a separate commission that makes the determination if that statute has been violated, whether it's a local statute or a state statute, and then they impose the penalty. Um, specifically, we looked at New York. New York, in addition to uh, the uh, EEOC as well as Title VII, we have, uh, they have their own specific New York City human rights law, um, which specifically um, prohibits discrimination of, under a variety of things, but also including their identification. Um, and they go further um, by indicating that this discrimination is also um, uh, included as well as uh, even the, even the, um, even if the person has on their identification a different gender or identity, um, you still cannot uh, dis discriminate um, simply because their official identification says something else. <clears throat> Under that law, a commission's been set up, um, and basically, um, it prevents gender discrimination based on one's perceived or actual gender. Uh, such through appearance or communication style. And they also have a general, this commission also, and this law also prevents gender discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, discriminatory har and harassment, as well as bias-based profiling by law enforcement. They issue penalties of up to $125,000 for those types of violations. And the behavior has to be willful, wanton, or malicious conduct. Um, Separately, the EEOC also addresses HIV and HIV status and discrimination under Title VII. And currently, um, uh, HIV or HIV status, um, the, the EEOC has clarified that uh, that would be considered, or it would be treated as a disability under the ADA. Um, the definition of a disability under the ADA is that you have a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits your ability to be able to perform major life activities. And those with HIV status would also fall under that category as well as being perceived 
because of their HIV, HIV status of not being able to um, or, or having a disability under that statute. Um, the, EC, the EEOC also has further stipulations uh, that provide uh, guidelines, not guidelines, but that provide rules uh, for what you cannot do with in asking questions about one's uh, HIV um, uh, status or HIV uh, or AIDS status. And they include when you're um, doing the initial interviews, when you're doing the initial um, the hiring process, and, and also then afterwards for um, your regular employment. Um, in New York City, they also, uh, with that civil rights law, also address um, uh, HIV or AIDS status. Um, and then there are some additional rules for posting these discrimination laws and what you should include. Um, under the EEOC, there are specific, and these are, this is a separate issue from the public accommodation posting that's in the bill. This is for employers posting the federal discrimination laws. And so we are required to post um, you know, laws alerting employees of their rights um, that you know, federal law prohibits job discrimination based off of race, color, sex, including pregnancy and related conditions, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, religion, age, equal pay, disability, which includes HIV, uh, status or AIDS status, um, and retaliation. And the posters should be conspicuous. Um, the posters should, uh, employers are also suggested to post these notices digitally. And then the ADA also kicks in where, um, as employers, uh, we need to also provide uh, printed notices to employees that may have limited mobility um, and cannot uh, um, access uh, where they would be able to see those notices. Um, so lastly, uh, the Department of Human Resources supports best practices uh, that attract and retain quality candidates for employment within the city of Baltimore. Um, to that end, providing further protections against discrimination is crucial in building, and attracting, and retaining a diverse workforce within city government and within the city of Baltimore as a whole. However, the Department of Human Resources respectfully defers to the Law Department with respect to legal sufficiency regarding issues of public accommodations and legal requirements for, for signage posting for public areas and statutory consequences for violating the proposed ordinance and whether that ordinance would be preempted by existing federal labor law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, we have the Department of Health. It's the one on the right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Julia Roche uh, from the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, thank you for. Uh, allowing us to respond to this bill. We stand by our agency report. Um, we've requested a favorable position on the bill um, with consideration for the importance of protecting everyone from discrimination based on health status, gender identity, sexual orientation, gender expression. Um, as you may know, the health department houses the Bureau of Clinical Services and HIV slash STI prevention and the Bureau of Ryan White and Community Risk Reduction Services. Among other things, these bureaus provide services to Baltimoreans who have or are at increased risk for HIV or AIDS, provide HIV prevention education, and work to reduce HIV and AIDS related stigma. And we also work with um, multiple um, community groups who share this mission as well. Um, so we stand by our report and are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, and forgive me, um, also not listed on the uh, referred agencies, but of course the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Uh, you can press the right button and the light will come on. It's on the microphone. There we go. Hello. Oh, you can back up. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is London Smith Derichelieu. I am the director of the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs. And the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs favorably supports this legislation and expresses an urgency for the committee to vote on this today. 
and to enact these protections today and get them to city council. Um, Baltimore City has consistently stood on the right side of history when it comes to uplifting, validating, and protecting our LGBTQ constituents, our employees, and visitors. Um, this great city, Baltimore, was one of the first to protect gender identity and gender expression in its city ordinance. It is one of the reasons and one of the I made the decision to come and move back to Baltimore because this would be a safe haven for myself. Baltimore City was one of the, uh, not just one of the first cities to affirm for its constituents, but also its employees with gender affirming care by providing gender affirming surgeries for its employees. We were one of the first cities to provide protections when it comes to the bathroom law. We were one of the first cities to protect our students with the JBB policy. Baltimore City uh, also scored a 103 on the MEI index. And actually, so that's, we scored over, the perfect score is a score of 100. Baltimore City this year, 2023, during my tenure, we scored a score of 103. The MEI index examines how inclusive municipal laws, policies, and services are of LGBTQ plus people who live and work there. And cities are rated based on non-discrimination laws and municipality as an employer, municipal services, law enforcement, and leadership on LGBTQ equality. We, like many localities, have continually set the precedence and the tone for state and federal legislation. The mayor has committed to promoting equity, and with my office, our goal is to improve the health, safety, and well-being of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning constituents. We know that LGBTQ plus community is a thriving group that has a unique health need, and it must be addressed. They represent diverse ages, racial and ethnic backgrounds, religious convictions, and belief systems, as do our allies. In partnership with the Office of Civil Rights and Equity, my office hosted a huge community forum that guided the need for this legislation. It was community driven, and it was to discuss closing the gaps and protections for the protected classes and accommodations. We hosted this event um, with the author of Mo Montgomery County's similar legislation, which is the LGBTQ Bill of Rights. This leg legislation would declare it discriminatory to willfully and repeatedly use someone's incorrect name or pronoun after being told repeatedly not to do so. It is hostile and cruel to consistently refer to someone through misgendering and is similar to teasing a person with a medical condition. The city has worked meticulous to address discrimination by best practices and protocols, including the consent decrees charged to address impartial and unfair policing and our policy 720, which requires officers to address persons by their chosen name and pronouns. We have multiple posted signs designating safe spaces in Baltimore with these further protections leads us to a designation as a safe haven for LGBTQ persons. This is a no brainer and it solidifies our commitment as a city to being a city that's for equity, diversity, inclusion, and non-discrimination. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to questions, if anyone's got any questions. Uh, Councilman Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did have a question. Um, what's the protocol for when these laws are not enforced? Like, how is the public supposed to engage um, with protecting their rights, but also what is the standard protocol? And I ask that question for public record so that if there is any um, not following of this law, it's on public record um, and people know so that we can share it with our constituents. I think I can start. Um, I know, uh, oh. Just to sort of tack on to that. How is it enforced? I can speak to who the public can report discrimination and things like that to. So the um, Community Relations Commission is um, under the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, and they do take um, reports from the public, and they do an investigation. Um, and if applicable, they will bring in different city agencies if the agency has violated, um, or even a city employee. Um, so they do have the power to do that. So they can make a... Um, a report to the Community Relations Commission, and then they do an investigation from there. And then I can share with you a link to um, that report as well, so you can share with your constituents. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, just to kind of reframe my question, it's more of a public, so you know, businesses or any type of like, hospitals, some of these issues that 
Councilwoman, turn on the mic. <laughs> Some, you know, I, I do appreciate that, um, Mr. Schneller. Um, but my question was really more towards public entities. You know, given that these are set ordinances within the city of Baltimore, I want to make sure that our hospital systems, our, our juvenile systems, are appropriately um, adhering to the laws that we set forth. From what we have, uh, from, from the research that the Department of Human Resources has done, what we've seen is that the, stat, the, uh, the jurisdiction sets up the statute and the commission at the same time. The statute normally has mention of the commission, its enforcement powers, what it does. Um, we don't see that with this one, but with New York, there is specifically, in, in California, there are specifically commissions that are, that are separate and only enforce you know, those laws uh, with respect to the public, uh, public accommodations, the sign postings, and they make the determinations when uh, complaints are filed or if they uh, are out doing their regular regulatory work, but they make the determination whether a violation is a violation under the, the terms of the statute, mm -hmm. and they also are the ones that set the penalty amount and impose the penalty. But okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's its own it's its separate own independent separate commission. Okay. okay. That, um, before you ask your question, ma'am. Um, I can re oh, respond yes, too. So the, um, the section of the code, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, falls under the Community Relations Commission. They're mm -hmm. also, um, I thought it was a good question, I pulled it up. And uh, there's a, obviously an investigation and hearing yeah. process. The commission also has the ability to issue civil penalties. Okay. Um, they do have that latitude. Does that uh, incur state agencies as well? I don't know, but we can find yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, businesses, private businesses, they can issue fines. Okay. Um, and by, I want to. Councilman Ramos, we can't, we can't hear you. Yeah, no, yeah. and so like my, my goal is to really get um, at, the, at the crux of the issue that we're experiencing with correctional facilities, with public hospitals. Um, you know, that's why I want to make sure that this commission has an oversight or some sort of latitude or connection to a state level counterpart um, so that enforcement can in incur on that level as well. And I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. So, yes, if I may. So, um, Article 4, Baltimore City Code enforcement goes through all of the mechanisms for um, filing a complaint, starting an investigation. And so, any person claiming to be aggrieved by an alleged unlawful practice made by himself or his attorney make, sign, and file with the commission a complaint in writing under oath. And so that's, that's 4.4-1 section A. Um, and then it just goes through um, investigations, hearings, um, judicial and appellate review. And so that is all contained in Article 4. Sorry, sir. Um, the ambiguity of section four and how it can be um, interpreted, I think we have to get very specific on that. Um, and so if there's not some, some sort of entity, we need to at least develop it at the state level. You see other jurisdictions like Montgomery County have essentially executed this, maybe forming some sort of collaborative that they do have some sort of state level connection from the municipal level as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Ramos. Just a, a, a question. Um, generally, there are, uh, there's complaints that people can make to the Attorney General's office or to um, that particular entity doing an investigation. So the question, I guess, is whether or not we need to reference that in this bill as well or um, you know, in terms of being very super clear that the opportunity, I'm just trying to figure out, yeah, you know, that tie, because there's, there's already, I think there's already mechanisms at the state level, but that if somebody's reading this law and they're seeing, uh, cause this is going to be embedded, I believe in article four and then it'll like, what else, what are all, what are all the options for that person 
to make a, a complaint. So it's the Civil Rights Commission here, but if there's a complaint at the state level, what to do? Is that Does that make sense? I mean, I don't know if we need to put it here or at least make some, do some education around that. Um, just trying to um, make and does that Yeah, the only thing that comes to my brain is if the state's attorney, I mean, I'm not state's attorney. Attorney general. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. The attorney general, um, they have some sort of oversight of like public hospitals. I don't know if that's the case. Like DGS, corrections, what is the oversight mechanism the for the hospitals, for the correctional facilities? And I'm not sure, I'm not positive that the attorney general has oversight. And maybe Elena, you can shine light on this. I don't know. I haven't done the research, but you know, I don't know. Good afternoon, Elena and Peter for the law department. I think there's, you're right, there are, there are several um, ways of enforcing this type of uh, violation. Um, we have our local process, there's a state process, and I think there may even be a federal process, although I'm not exactly sure what that is. But um, they, are, they are all way, they are not mutually exclusive, they can be pr um, pursued simultaneously. So I don't, I think that the, the, the Department of Human Resources probably can speak to the notice that gets put up identifying the different uh, ways that this can be enforced. Any other questions? All right, seeing no questions, uh, we will move on to public testimony. Um, we have four, four folks signed up today. Um, uh, please proceed to the mic here, uh, and you'll be given two minutes to testify. Uh, first, we have Renee Lau. Good afternoon. I'm Renee Lau, Director of uh, Senior and Disabled Housing for Baltimore Safe Haven. Today's hearing is especially heartfelt because of the people who come into our agency and our organization who are HIV positive or have AIDS and cannot find housing for themselves because of their condition or their mental health. Right now, with the negative attitude in many of our red states toward our community, it is very gracious that Baltimore City is opening its heart. And I hope that this city and this state, because we're gonna start getting an influx of people from these other states, uh, that we become a safe haven for those individuals. And not only for the people in the LBGTQ community, but also those seeking abortions. Um, I could not be here today I is recuperating from some surgery, but she says to give her best to you all. And if you want to, on the humorous side, if you want to do something away with, help with one of your schools and save hundreds of thousands of dollars, you could donate one to Baltimore Safe Haven so we could have a, a transitional compound. Uh, but uh, there have been some incidents recently with some of my clients and one in particular was at Penn Station. Whoever was working security there at that time was gonna refuse our client to use the agenda appropriate bathroom and refuse to call the individual by her proper pronoun. And the questions that you were directing, where do you get file these complaints? Is there an inspector general for each agency? Where do we file these complaints? How do we file these complaints? And how do we follow up on these complaints? There has been some medical providers that do the same exact thing, who will mis purposely misgender a person or by accident misgender, and we understand there will be instances. Like, I have no problem in public until I open my mouth, because I've never had any voice training, okay? 
then I become sir. If it's not apparent by the outside of my appearance that I'm living my life as my authentic self, then that is a problem, not my problem, that is someone else's problem. And this legislation, hopefully, hopefully, will bring comfort to many in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Sh Charmaine Stern. I can't read, read the last name. Hello, my name is Charmaine Stern Meganson. I'm here today to represent Light Health and Wellness and our organization provides services to those impacted or affected by HIV and AIDS. We are always seeing situations where the clients are experiencing discrimination things against them just because they're HIV positive. Also, some of our clients are experiencing the same issues who are living in the LGBTQ community. For instance, we had a client who called us in tears because she was so excited about a job that she had just been approved to work for. When she got there, she was turned away because they said, oh, you're, you're a sir. And she said, no, that's not my pronouns. She was turned away and devastated. Um, it's very important today that you guys pass this legislation to fill the gap. Nobody knows where to go to file these complaints. Myself, as a person living with HIV, almost 20 years, have experienced several, several bad experiences in the hospital systems, in places, public places. I had a bad experience in one of the hospitals where I shared my status, and the triage nurse in the big waiting room snatched the cuff off me once I ex exposed my status to her and said, you have AIDS? I felt very disgusted. I felt helpless. I went to legal aid to get help. They didn't even know what to do to get me out. From there, I felt like maybe I shouldn't share my status, but then I wouldn't be able to be an advocate for my clients or many others in our city who are also dealing with this discrimination that's continuing. We are in a city and state which each year we're always top 10 for statistics with HIV. If that doesn't say that we need legislation to fill gaps because of the numbers of our study increasing and it shows that we are in top 10, I don't know where else we should start. But I think that here is going to be the, the main place to get it started, at least to have these things in place to protect those who pronouns aren't being pr pronounced properly who aren't being respected or seen as the individuals that they are. I mean, they say we have equal housing opportunity, but is it really equal housing opportunity if I fill out my application and I'm approved and I show up and I'm not who you think I am? To me, you know, this is who I identify as, but just because you don't see me as that does not give you the right to turn me away from this place that I've already been approved for, that you're denying me to live. So today, I'm, I'm asking all of you to consider on passing this today. Time is of the essence. We need this protection, and we need it filled immediately. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we've got Justin Winston. Uh, how y'all doing today? Um, my name is Justin Winston. I'm here with the Prots and Merlin. I am also one of the clients who get access help from uh, Lay Health and Wellness. I have been positive now for 15 years. Um, within my time being positive. I've also just, uh, went through discrimination. I've been fired from a job because of my status. Um, I've also been turned away from different insurance policies because of my status. Um, I've had issues with 
uh, the hospitals as well, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to treat somebody who's HIV positive. I've also had uh, actual like landlords turn me away because they didn't want somebody who had AIDS living in their house. Um, I'm asking y'all today, I'm gonna keep it brief, I'm asking y'all today to pass this legislation, to, to pass the, I'm sorry y'all, <laughs> to pass the bill because it's people like me who go through these things that don't know how to handle it. And you know, HIV is, is, is for some people, it's a trigger. Um, it can, it, it, one wrong move, it can turn somebody off and next thing you know, you know, suicide rates go up, hate to say it, because people don't know how to deal with being positive, they don't know how to deal with having a voice being positive. So the only, the only thing that they know is to take their own life. Um, I've seen, I've had friends who've done it. So in regard, I'm just, you know, from the heart, we got past it today. You know, like Charmaine said, time is out of essence and, you know, this bill could, this bill could definitely save a life. Um, thank you all. You dropped your sticker. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anyone else uh, signed up. Um, and I just want to note, um, f folks have been uh, obviously calling for it to pass today. Very rarely um, do we pass bills in the first time we hear it in committee. Uh, it's just a matter of practice, just to make sure that we have an opportunity to work through issues and make sure that council members have the ability to fully read the bill. Um, and so we're not gonna move the bill today. Just wanna be very transparent in that process. I understand we are doing, um, we're trying to meet a timeline and we still hope to meet that timeline. We're trying to find a date that works, so uh, don't you worry. Um, but just wanna let you know, we're not gonna vote on the bill today. Uh, any other testimony uh, for folks here or um, even folks online, please use the raise hand function and we'll make sure to acknowledge you. Yes. Oh, please. Step up and uh, state your name, and you got two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle. Um, I'm actually a new uh, resident of the state. I mean, of the of the city, and I just want to like say whatever. Is, this is a safe space for me since I'm, you know, trans, and I think I want to thank you all. Um, I think I feel like. No, I've been, um, I've experienced a lot of job discrimination at a, a company I used to work for, not in the city, out in the county, um, and it was really bad. It, it was, I, I still, like, it traumatized me. And, you know, I, I would like to know, like, resources on how, how I can take action against that. Um, yeah. And then also like like getting attacked and you know for being trans out where I used to live and stuff like that. It's and I'm thankful for the city. And, all right, that's all I have to say. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Um, any other testimony, folks want to testify who are here? I'm going to leave open testimony for another 10 seconds. All right, um, seeing no further testimony, uh, testimony is closed. I, I want to thank everybody. Um, Councilman, you have any closing statements before we wrap up? I do. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming out today, for sharing your stories. This stuff is never easy to stand in public and share what you have experienced because I know it's traumatic. Uh, and so I just want to thank you all for coming out. I knew this bill was important. You have affirmed why it's important uh, by sharing your story and living your authentic selves and coming out and, and demanding action um, from this body and from the city of Baltimore. And we're going to get it done. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to make sure this gets done in, in time for uh, Pride. Uh, and so I'm excited and looking forward to being there with you all to celebrate, uh, you know, this new day, an important step uh, that the city's taken to protect all of our residents. So um, with that, uh, we will make sure you all know when the next hearing is going to be scheduled, it will probably be after the budget, um, uh, budget process, but before Pride and before the next council meeting on the 12th. So uh, we'll be in touch and thank you all for coming out. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Up oh, one moment. Please uh, turn your mic and ask away. For the, um, for the office, um, 
Did you all submit a budget request? That's to you, ma'am. Yes. Me? Yes, oh, I'm like, sorry. Oh. Like yeah. No, but I would like to. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. No further questions, no further testimony. Uh, this hearing's in recess. Thank you.